Intermolecular forces. So we talked about them and their effects. Now we're going to talk about what they are. Um, kind of already covered this. They are electrostatic in nature, so um, between opposite charges. Um, dispersion forces are the weakest intermolecular force. They are present in all substances. They also go by other names. They are sometimes called um, London forces or London dispersion forces or van der Waals forces or induced dipole forces. So they've got lots of names. Uh, we're going to try to call them dispersion forces. These are caused by fluctuations in the electron distribution within molecules or atoms. Um, we've talked a little bit about electrons and how they're arranged in the atoms. They are... Um, they're able to fluctuate. Um, they, they're moving essentially independently of each other. And so at any given time, you could find um, more electrons on one side of the atom than on the other. So here's an illustration of a helium atom. So a helium atom has two protons in its nucleus and two electrons. And so if we took pictures of this at any given time, um, we might see that the, you know, usually the electrons are kind of on opposite sides of the atom, but sometimes they're on one side. Um, this reminds me of a time when I walked into the living room and I saw all six of my kids on half of the couch. Usually they're like spread out, you know, for a while one of them was in Kansas, I mean like really spread out, but it, even when they're home, they're like, you know, in their rooms, they're spread out all over the place. But no, this one time, all six of them on half the couch are like piled on top of each other. I took a picture because I'm like, I'll probably never see that happen again. It was spontaneous. It just happened. I didn't arrange it. That can happen with the electrons too. They're, they're moving just for our purposes randomly around in here and they can get lopsided. So if all of the electrons are on this side or more are on this side, then this side of the atom gets a little bit negative and this side of the atom is going to be a little bit positive. You okay with that? It's a little bit like a boat. you got a bunch of people on a boat, and you go past something interesting, like maybe you're taking a, a cruise on the San Francisco Bay, and you go by Alcatraz, and all the people go to the Alcatraz side of the boat. And the boat might tip just a smidge, right? Because there's more weight on one side. That's what's happening here. So spontaneously can happen. When that spontaneously happens in one atom, it can induce that to happen in the neighboring atom. So this one gets lopsided, negative charge here, positive charge here, partial, very small, bless you. Um, this positive charge here attracts the electrons in the neighboring atom and causes this to be lopsided also. It's an induced dipole. That one got lopsided on its own, and then it causes this one to get lopsided. Well, now we have positive and negative, and there's a bit of attraction between those two atoms. And then this guy gets unlopsided, the kids get off the couch, and it's over. This one getting lopsided because of that one can cause this to happen in a neighboring molecule, and, and that can just go on and on and on. These interactions are extremely brief, and they're very weak, but they happen a lot. And that's what a dispersion force is. It's a temporary attraction between two atoms due to an imbalance in the electrons. Yep, said all that. How strong that force is depends on some things. Um, mostly on how easy is it to make that electron cloud out of balance. The larger the electron cloud, the further those electrons are from the nucleus, the easier it is to have it be lopsided. So larger atoms are going to have higher dispersion forces, stronger dispersion forces than smaller ones will. The, the electron cloud is more easily polarized. Molar mass is not the only factor in determining how strong the dispersion force is but it's the one I expect you to recognize as when you're asked to predict some things about different molecules or atoms. Okay, So larger 
think, you know, big flabby floppy thing, right? It can get lopsided more easily than something that's small and tight. We can see the effect of the strength in dispersion forces on the boiling point of a substance. So in order for a, 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 a liquid to boil, the particles have to have enough energy to break loose of the forces that are holding them together, right? So if the forces are very weak, you don't need as much energy, and the substance will boil at a lower temperature. If those substances are very tightly held together, the dispersion forces are strong, you're going to have to get a lot more thermal energy. So let's go back to Red Rover. So think about um, a group of kindergartners playing Red Rover, and uh, maybe the, the linemen of the Fresno City College football team playing Red Rover. Which line is going to be harder to break through, the kindergartners or the football players? The football players. Why? Because their grip is stronger, right? To break through, you're going to have to run a lot faster than to get through the line with the kindergartners. So in order for a liquid to boil, you have to have enough energy. The person has to be running fast enough to break through. If the forces are strong, if the grip is strong, the temperature will be higher, the boiling point will be higher. So high boiling point, strong intramolecular forces. Low boiling point, weak intramolecular forces. So if we look at the noble gases, here are their molar masses. Helium's the smallest and xenon is the largest. And we see that the trend in the boiling points follows the trend in the molar mass because xenon has a larger electron cloud it is more easy to polarize, to get lopsided, and cause this dispersion force with neighboring molecules. So there's more attraction between xenon atoms than there is between helium atoms. That make sense? So we should be able to do things like this. Uh, answer a question. Which hydrocarbon, CH4 or C2H6, has the higher boiling point? This is another one where I expect you to be having a little conversation with yourself and talking through this. And so you say, well, higher boiling point, bless you, higher boiling point means that the particles are held more strongly together, so it's harder to get through. So I'm looking for stronger forces, and which one is going to be stronger? Well, what's the difference between these? This is bigger, right? This has two carbon atoms, and that has one carbon atom. So this is a larger molecule. Larger things are floppier, easier to polarize. They're going to have stronger dispersion forces. So which one has a higher boiling point? The bigger one. This one. Any questions? That's it. Yeah. So think about Red Rover. Speed, running, how fast you're moving, that's temperature. Kinetic energy. How strong the grip of the players is, that's the strength of the intermolecular force. If the intermolecular force is strong, you're going to have to run faster. You're going to have to have a higher temperature to get it to boil. Another force is the dipole-dipole force. So dispersion forces are present in everything. Dipole-dipole forces are present in polar substances. Um, it's similar to the dispersion force in that it's an attraction between partial charges. The difference is that polar molecules have permanent dipoles. This isn't a temporary fluctuation in electrons. This imbalance is always present. So dipole-dipole forces are stronger than dispersion forces. Um, well, the, no, the dispersion force, I'm sorry, the, um, the overall force, either dispersion or dipole-dipole, is going to be constant for a given substance, the force of attraction between the particles. The difference with the dipole, di with the, the grief. I'm confusing myself. Okay, the difference with the dispersion force is as those attractions between two individual atoms come and go. 
overall, the strength of that is the same. It's just that the attraction is changing between different atoms. In a dipole-dipole force, the attractions are always there. They're not coming and going. And so they're, the, the charge is a little bit larger, this, so that makes it stronger, and the fact that it's always there makes the dipole-dipole force stronger. Does that help? So we see that polar substances generally have higher melting and boiling points than similar sized nonpolar molecules. Because in addition to those induced dipoles, the, the dispersion forces, they also have the dipole-dipole forces. So they have two types of attraction. More attraction means higher boiling point, higher melting point. So this is uh, formaldehyde. So we see there's a carbon and an oxygen and two hydrogens. When we look at this, we should be able to use my, my simplified method for figuring out is this polar or nonpolar. We look at the carbon, we ask ourselves, that central atom, are there any lone pairs? No. Are the atoms bonded to the carbon all the same? No. There's an oxygen. The oxygen is different than the hydrogens polar molecule. The oxygen is more electronegative, it's closer to fluorine on the periodic table, and so it's going to pull the electrons to this end of the molecule. This end slightly negative, this end slightly positive, all the time. So between two formaldehyde molecules, there's going to be this attraction. Mm -hmm. Okay, the, this little d, it's the lowercase Greek delta, Looks like a letter D with a posture issue, right? That stands for a partial charge. So it's not that this is an ion. This isn't a minus one charge and a plus one charge. It might be a plus 0.1 charge and a minus 0.1 charge. It's a fractional charge. Exactly how much the charge is, we don't care. It's just some charge. Any other questions? So we can see the effect of polarity on melting and boiling points. So here we have formaldehyde. We just looked at that. It's a polar molecule. Here's ethane. If you draw that out, carbon, carbon, hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen. There's not a single central atom. But is this very symmetrical with no lone pairs? Yeah. Carbon-hydrogen bonds are, are actually considered nonpolar because carbon and hydrogen are very close in electronegativity. So anytime you see something that's just carbons and hydrogens, it's going to be a nonpolar substance. Even if it was C, one C in the middle of Mm-hmm. The, that one's a little easier for us to um, predict because you look at the Lewis structure and my rules will, will, will help you with that one. So there's no lone pairs and all of these atoms bonded to the carbon have the same electronegativity. They're the same, so the molecule is nonpolar. This one's a little trickier because if you look at this one, you say, well, the carbon is different than the hydrogens, but the same is true over here and so... If you want to discuss that further, I will. I'm not going to try to trick you with predicting polarity of large organic molecules. If it's just carbons and hydrogens, it's going to be nonpolar. So here we've got nonpolar, here we've got polar. The molar mass is almost identical. There's the structures. I guess I didn't need to draw that. I should have looked at my own slide. Let's look at what happens with the melting point and boiling point. So here's the boiling point of formaldehyde is minus 19. The boiling point of ethane is minus 88. Now negatives give us pause. Which is colder, minus 88 or minus 19? Minus 88. It's farther from zero, below. So this boils at a much lower temperature than formaldehyde does because the forces that hold these molecules together in the liquid state are much weaker than the forces that hold the formaldehyde together. They both have dispersion forces. The strength of the dispersion forces are the same because the molecules are of the same size. 
but this molecule has dipole-dipole forces on top of that. So it's held more strongly, it boils at a higher temperature. Any questions? Yeah. So you can tell dipole-dipole you can predict, um, yeah, you can predict what forces it will have just by looking at the structure. Yep. So everything has dispersion forces. Polar molecules have dipole-dipole forces. Um, these intermolecular forces affect miscibility. So miscibility means the ability of a liquid to mix with another liquid without separating into two phases. Um, it's, it's kind of a weird word. Um, if you think of it as being like mixability, which is not an actual word, but you know what you, you know, if I said mixability, you could probably figure out what that means. So this is um, miscibility, mixability. Two liquids can just mix in any ratio. This is true of alcohol and water. You could put a teaspoon of, of ethanol in water, it'll mix fine. You can take a teaspoon of water and put it in pure ethanol. It'll mix just fine. They are miscible. Oil and water are not miscible. They are immiscible. And that's because the types of intermolecular forces are different. So we have this general saying, like dissolves like. So in general, polar liquids are miscible. They will mix with other polar liquids. And nonpolar liquids will mix with other nonpolar liquids, but polar and nonpolar don't mix together. Opposites do not attract in, in terms of types of intermolecular forces. Remember, I talked about the Swedes and the Japanese in the room talking together. So, the type of intermolecular force is, is a bit like language. And so, there's this force of attraction. There's this commonality that you can communicate with a person, and so you're more likely to interact with them than if you have no way of communicating with them. So this is um, an illustration of pentane and water. Pentane is um, C5H12. Just carbons and hydrogens, it's a nonpolar molecule. It has dispersion forces only. Water has dipole-dipole forces and dispersion forces. It is more strongly attracted, and so it squeezes out the pentane, excludes it. Same thing with oil and water. There's a picture of an oil spill from um, a tanker. The oil, the petroleum products, do not mix with the seawater. So in a way, this is a bad thing because you get this oil slick on the water, but in another way, it's a good thing because you can go and scoop that up and get it out of the water instead of just polluting the whole thing. So we've gone over this before. The book's method, I'm not even going to talk about that. Um, my method works most of the time. I figure that's good enough. Molecules nonpolar if there are no lone pairs in the central atom, and the atoms bonded to the central atom are identical or they have the same electronegativity. So determine whether each molecule has dipole-dipole forces. So this is carbon tetraiodide. It's not four chlorine atoms. It's a little hard to tell, right? That's why I gave you the name. So we need to look at the Lewis structure. So here we've got carbon, and we've got four chlorines. Yeah, they're iodides. Thank you. Or iodides. Uh, and then there would be some lone pairs on the iodides, iodines. But there won't be any lone pairs on the carbon. So you should be able to draw that, but you'll, you'll need to know how to do Lewis structures. If I give you the Lewis structure, you should be able to tell me, is this molecule polar? No. No lone pairs on the carbon. All the atoms bonded to the carbon are the same. This is a nonpolar <coughs> molecule. Does it have dipole-dipole forces? No. Only polar molecules 
have dipole dipole forces. What about CH3Cl? So put the carbons there and the hydrogens and round and then this is going to have like this. Polar or nonpolar? Polar. No lone pairs on the central atom, but we've got three hydrogens and we have a chlorine. This one's different. And so this is lopsided. It's going to have one end that's different than the other. So does that substance have dipole dipole forces? Yes. Question? So polar molecules always have one end that's different than all the others? Yes. Yep, polar molecules will be lopsided. Um, and, and that's why the lone pair on that central atom is a dead giveaway. That's going to make it lopsided, absolutely. Um, but you can also get it lopsided by having a more electronegative element bonded um, with less electronegative. And so this chlorine is more electronegative. It's closer to fluorine on the periodic table. And so it's going to pull the electron density towards itself. This end is going to be a little negative. The rest of it is going to be a little positive. So the ends are different. What about HCl? Well, this is a diatomic molecule, right? Just two atoms. These are easier. You just got hydrogen bonded to chlorine. We can put the, put the dots in there, but all we have to ask ourselves, there's only one bond. Is the bond polar? Are the atoms in that bond different? Yeah. Now, you can have a bond between two different atoms that's nonpolar, but I'm not going to ask you one like that. What I want you to remember for an individual bond, if the elements are different, I expect you to tell me it's a polar bond. If the elements are the same, it is absolutely a nonpolar bond, because how could there be any difference? They're the same. So this also will work most of the time. Is, does HCl have dipole-dipole forces? Yeah. Any questions? Third type of intermolecular force is called hydrogen bonding. So hydrogen bonding happens in polar molecules, but only some of them. Polar molecules where you have hydrogen atoms bonded directly to fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. They have this additional intermolecular force called a hydrogen bond. Um, you can think of a hydrogen bond as sort of being super dipole-dipole force. It's the same type of force, it's just a lot stronger. Okay, so it's super dipole-dipole force. So how do you remember this? Which, which things are going to have hydrogen bonding and which ones are not? Have you seen the movie E.T.? What did E.T. say? He pointed at the sky and he says, E.T. phone home, right? <laughs> phone home. He said it like that. Okay, so, right? Thank you. F-O-N, bonded to hydrogen. <coughs> Polar molecule with fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen directly bonded to hydrogen. It will have hydrogen bonding. A hydrogen bond is not a covalent bond. It's just a super dipole-dipole force. The reason it's fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen and not some of the other elements is that these are the three most electronegative elements, and they are also small. And so that allows the molecules to be closer together, and the, the force of attraction is going to be stronger. So ET phone home. Hydrogen bonds are not covalent bonds. Hydrogen bonds are between molecules. Covalent bonds are within the same molecule. The term hydrogen bond is confusing because, you know, you look at a hydrogen molecule, right? Does that have a hydrogen bond? 
It doesn't have hydrogen bonding. It doesn't have the intermolecular force hydrogen bonding. Is there a covalent bond between two hydrogens? Yeah. That's confusing. F-O-N, directly bonded to hydrogen. Um, they're much weaker. They're like 2 to 5% as strong as a covalent bond. They're the strongest intermolecular force of the three we've talked about, but they're not e anywhere close to the strength of a covalent bond. So that's not hydrogen bonding. So let's look at um, HF. So is this a polar molecule? Yeah. yeah. We have just one bond. It's between hydrogen and fluorine. These are different. We predict this is polar. We say ET phone home, fluorine and hydrogen. This could have hydrogen bonding. So here, it's a lot like those dipole-dipole forces, but the charges here are stronger. They're still not minus one, plus one, but they're larger than they are for the other di um, polar molecules. So it's the force of attraction between the negative end of one molecule and the positive of another, and it's always going to be hydrogen in this case. Methanol. Here's a methanol. We see we have hydrogen bonded to oxygen. Phone home, FO. So we've got O and the H. Direct bond there. This can have hydrogen bonding. This is a polar molecule. That oxygen has lone pairs. When you look at it, it's, it's lopsided, right? One end is different than the other. So the hydrogen on one of these molecules has a partial positive charge, and it will be attracted to the oxygen on a neighboring molecule. And this will cause methanol to have a higher boiling point than a similar size substance that does not have hydrogen bonding. We can compare methanol and ethane. So what do you think? Polar or nonpolar? Nonpolar. It's very symmetrical looking, right? This one's polar, it's lopsided, and we have hydrogen-oxygen bond here. So ET phone home, oxygen to hydrogen in a polar molecule, this one has hydrogen bonding. Look at the differences in their boiling points. Their molar masses are really similar, minus 88, positive 64. That's a huge difference. They both have dispersion forces. But methanol has dipole-dipole forces, and it has hydrogen bonding. Water molecules have hydrogen bonding. Polar molecule with an OH bond. So the negative end is the oxygen, and that is attracted to the positive end, which is a hydrogen on a neighboring molecule, and that's what the hydrogen bond is. The boiling point of water is 100 degrees Celsius. That's crazy high for a molecule of that size. And it's because of the very strong hydrogen bonding that water has. Hydrogen bonding is important in lots and lots of things. Um, proteins have hydrogen bonding that holds them in per their particular globular shape. When a protein gets denatured and those intermolecular forces are broken, then it doesn't function anymore. Your DNA is held together by hydrogen bonding. The base pairs in the DNA that hold the two strands together are held together by hydrogen bonding. The reason that cytosine and guanine always pair up together is they are perfectly matched to form three hydrogen bonds. Thymine and adenine match up to form two hydrogen bonds. So when your DNA replicates, the double strand is separated and it can make um, a new strand by matching up the base pairs. Really, really cool, all due to hydrogen bonding. So we should be able to make a prediction like this. Which has the higher boiling point, HF or HCl? And then the dreaded question, why? So the way you answer this is you, you ask yourself, well, what kinds of intermolecular forces do these compounds have? Everything has dispersion forces. Are these molecules polar? Yeah, they're both diatomic. So just a hydrogen and with hydrogen fluorine 
and hydrogen chlorine. They're both polar, so they both have dipole-dipole forces. So, so far everything's you know, pretty similar. Do either of these have hydrogen bonding? Yeah, which one? This one. This one has hydrogen bonding. So they, this one has hydrogen bonding, um, the, and this one does not. Hydro, the extra interaction from the hydrogen bonding is what's causing that to have a higher boiling point. So you would say HF has the higher boiling point because it has hydrogen bonding and HCl does not. Any questions? And then there's the ion dipole force. Um, ion dipole force only happens in solution. Um, it's the force that occurs between um, ionic compounds and polar compounds. And where it's important to us is in aqueous solutions of ionic compounds. So this ion dipole force can only happen in a mixture. It can't happen in a pure compound. So what happens when sodium chloride dissolves we have this dipole substance, I'm sorry, this polar substance water. Um, and so the water molecules have a positive end, and that positive end is attracted to the negative chloride ion. It's an interaction between a dipole and an ion, ion dipole force. The sodium ion is positive, but the other end of water can be attracted to that. And so that's the ion dipole force. It's a for force of attraction between a polar molecule and an ion. Table from your book, um, relative strength, dispersion force is the weakest, then dipole, dipole force, then hydrogen bond, and the ion dipole is the strongest. Where is it present? All atoms, only polar molecules. ET phone home, um, mixtures of ionic compounds and polar molecules. This summary.